Okay, but for real. Hi, and me, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the edit mod tutorial. It took very long to make and took a lot of work. So yeah, if it helps you at all, a like would be very appreciated. We'll be going over how to make a data pack, how the level metadata is structured, how to use edit mode, how every single edit mode block works, and even some practical examples. Since this is a pretty long video, there are timestamps available to skip to any part that you need. Anyways, let's just get into it. Before we take a look at edit mode, let's go over the custom level data real quick. To add a level, start by making a new data pack. To do this, we go into a world's data packs folder and make a new directory which will contain our data pack. Uh, this can be called anything, the name doesn't really matter, so I'll, I'll just be calling it uh, cheeseburger. The name doesn't matter, this doesn't matter at all. And in there, make a new file called pack.mcmeta. It's essentially just a JSON file, but Minecraft likes having this uh, fancy file extension in there. The formatting of this uh, file is always the same, just has the pack format here. It basically indicates what version of Minecraft the pack was made for. For 1.20.1, the right format is 12. For your version, it might be different. So just look up which is the right one and put that there. And the description can be anything. That also really doesn't matter. Then you create another folder in there, called data. In that folder you make an, another folder which will be your namespace. Now this does actually matter. Hi, me, Yaya from the future. I completely forgot to go over what a fucking what a what a namespace is, what it what an ID that the thing that comes next is or how to use it. So I'm quickly gonna explain what an identifier is. You know how in Minecraft when you like summon an entity or uh, play a sound or whatever, you have this like Minecraft colon and then s some something. Um, that that is an identifier. The first part, the part before the uh, colon, is the the namespace, and that after is the ID. But yeah, everything has to be lowercase. Remember that. It's, it's very important. For this, I'll be using the namespace example. Then in there, you make another folder, and you call it Ultracraft. And then we make our final folder for now being level. In this folder, we can finally make our actual level data file. So we just make a new JSON file with the ID of the level. Epic style, the JSON. Yeah. Okay, now that we've done that, uh, we just gotta put in the data of the level. For this, I'll just be going over the different fields using the custom example, the JSON. The title field is the name your level will have on the travel screen. The description field is the description displayed when hovering over your level on the travel screen. This field can be left out if you don't want the description. And both the title and the description fields can take either a string or a translation key. The author key should hold your name. It will be displayed on the travel screen as well. The author link is an optional link that will be opened by clicking on the author's name. This could be a YouTube channel, Planet Minecraft profile, your website, or whatever you want. The structure field holds the identifier of your level structure. The levels themselves need to be saved as structures. You can export them using structure blocks. Since levels tend to be pretty big, I recommend using a mod like huge structure blocks to make it possible at all. The thumbnail is the identifier of the texture that you want displayed as your level's thumbnail. All of the builds and level's thumbnail's dimensions are 480 by 320 pixels. The ranking data is split into three categories, time, kills, and style. And each one of them has their own list of values. For time, uh, you start by putting the lowest time requirement at the top. This is the S rank, this is the A rank, and B, C, and anything below that. If you get uh, more than four minutes, then you will have a D. It's the same for kills. The kill requirement for an S rank is at the top, then A, then B, D, C, D, and again, same for style. The spawn offset is the position the player is supposed to spawn at when entering the level, relative to the level structure. The music field takes two sound identifiers, and one for the calm track, and one for the combat track. The suit is entirely optional. If it is present though, the level will say that it has music on the travel screen. The only thing to keep in mind with the music is to have both tracks be the same length, so they don't desync after a while. Lastly, there's the version field. This can be any integer. If the version is higher than last time the player played the level, it will be marked as unplayed on the travel screen. This doesn't remove past ranks or times, it's only a visual indicator that the level was updated. Alright, now onto the difficult but fun part. It's time to go over edit mode. The edit command is used to do literally anything. To toggle edit mode, use the command without any edit arguments. You can configure some aspects of edit mode using edit config. By default, while in edit mode you fly twice as fast as normal and have no clip enabled while still being in creative. This allows flying through your own structure without being restricted by walls and stuff and still like 
build it, or just fly through walls while scripting stuff, it's very useful. You'll also be shown lines between focused edit blocks and, and their areas. Optionally, you can also turn on ghost mode, which will make triggers ignore you. With the basic information done, let's move on to mapping blocks. When you aren't in edit mode, mapping blocks will have no selection area, meaning they can't be broken or interacted with by anyone not in edit mode. The blocks don't have any collision either, and unlike light blocks, cannot be replaced by placing other blocks in their spot. This makes them relatively safe to build around, though I would recommend putting them outside of the actual play area, if possible. Some of the blocks do need to be placed inside the area, but we'll go over that. There currently are three separate types of mapping blocks. Rooms, triggers, and listeners. Rooms are like the heart of mapping blocks. All other mapping blocks have to belong to a room. All blocks belonging to a room are considered as children. Children will only take if a non-spectator player is within the room's area. If a room holding children is broken, the children turn into orphans. Edit ping will also show you all orphans around you, and you can reparent them by right-clicking them and then a room. By themselves, they're not only lonely, but they also won't do anything. So it's better to reparent them to a room. Rooms also hold so-called flags. These flags are local to the room and can either be true or false. Flags can be bound to other mapping blocks using edit, flag, bind, then the focus key or type of the edit block, and then the name of the flag. Triggers are mapping blocks that perform a specific action if an entity enters them. The most basic of these are player and enemy triggers. They simply change the flag bound to them based on whether a player or enemy is inside their area. Listeners are mapping blocks that perform an action when the flag bound to them changes. Or in other words, they listen for a change. Opposed to triggers, most listeners don't have an area. A spawner listener, for example, will spawn a given entity at their position when their flag activates and despawn it again when it deactivates, if it's still alive at that point. An example for a listener that does have an area is door listeners. They replace all blocks of a specific type in their area with blocks of a different type when a flag bound to it changes. I'll get into the specifics of that later. Let's start with replacing a room block. It will automatically be registered as a known room. Normally, all mapping blocks are invisible. To find existing rooms around you, use Edit Ping. All rooms within your render distance have a line drawn directly to your crosshair, so you can easily find them from anywhere. To forget about all known rooms, use Edit Ping Clear. If you have a room focused, it will not be forgotten. And on the topic of focusing, you can right-click any mapping block to focus it. You can have one block per type focused at the same time. The names of focus blocks and their focus type, or key, is displayed in the top left of the edit mode hut. You can also unfocus blocks again simply by right clicking them. Once you've focused a room block, you can place other mapping blocks. They'll be automatically parented to the focused room. If you were to now unfocus the room block, all of its children will turn invisible and can't be interacted with anymore until you focus the room again. On the top right of the edit mode HUD, you should see the attributes of all currently focused blocks. You can edit these attributes by using edit attributes set then the focus key, the name of the attribute, and then the value. And that should be all basic information. Next I'll go over every single currently existing mapping block and briefly explain each of them and their attributes. After that I'll go over some practical examples. There's timestamps available so you can skip to any part you want or need. Rooms have two attributes. Reset cooldown and suppress modifications. The reset cooldown makes the room automatically reset after no players have been within the room for a certain amount of ticks. The value can be any integer. If you set it to zero or lower, the room won't reset based on this timer. Suppress modifications makes it impossible for survival players to break or place blocks within the room's area. Triggers detect players within their area and change a flag bound to them accordingly. There are four attributes. Is self-reset, activation delay, target threshold, and inverted. Self-resetting triggers will deactivate their bound flag again once their condition isn't met anymore. Activation delay makes it so that the targets have to stay in the trigger for a specific amount of ticks before it activates, and if it's self-resetting, the same is true for it deactivating. You can think of this process sort of like charging. While the condition is met, the timer rises, and if self-resetting, it lowers when the condition isn't met anymore. Setting the activation delay to 1 makes the trigger activate and deactivate immediately. The target threshold defines how many target entities have to be within the trigger for its condition to be met. Keep in mind that the target count has to be greater than the threshold. So if you want it to activate when only one target is within the trigger's area, leave it set to zero. The last attribute is invert. It basically just inverts the trigger's condition. So if a trigger activates when one target is within it, 
Inverting the trigger makes it active unless one target is within it. Enemy triggers are largely the same as player or regular triggers. The only real difference is that they are activated by hostile entities instead of players. Checkpoint triggers are a bit special. The tick by themselves, meaning the parent room doesn't need to have players inside of it for the checkpoint to work. When a player enters a checkpoint's area, the spawn point gets set to the checkpoint block's position. When a player dies, they'll respawn on top of the first free block directly below the, the checkpoint block. When a player respawns, the last checkpoint's parent room will reset if there aren't any living players left inside. Due to this property, I recommend putting a, a checkpoint in every room. Another special property of checkpoints is that they are one of the very few blocks that actually have rendering of their own. Checkpoints only have one attribute, being invisible, which is kind of self-explanatory. Progression triggers grant a progression entry to players that enter them. For this block, I should quickly explain the progression system. Players can only craft weapons they have unlocked and only equipped weapons they have obtained. You can change or see players' progression entries using the command Autocraft Progression and its subcommands. Progression Tricks attributes are Entry, Gives Item, Also Obtain, and Message. Entry defines which progression entry this trigger should grant. This can be any identifier. Just make sure it's written correctly to prevent frustration. When Gives Item is true, the trigger will attempt to give the target player an item with the same identifier as the progression entry. An item will only be given if the trigger has successfully unlocked the progression entry for the player. So if they already had the progression entry before entering it, they won't get an item. Or in other words, it will only give an item to players once. As explained earlier, you can unlock and obtain progression entries. Per default, progression triggers will only unlock the set progression entry. If also obtain is set to true, then it will also make them obtain the entry. The message defines the message that will be shown to a target when the trigger's progression entry has been successfully unlocked. This can be a normal string or a translation key. Timer triggers start or stop the current level's timer for players that enter the area. If the target isn't in a level, they won't do anything. Entering a trigger that stuns the timer while one is already running does not reset the timer. Timer triggers only have one attribute that defines whether it should start or stop the timer. Force travel triggers Kind of fun to say, false travel triggers. A anyways, false travel triggers open the travel screen for players that enter the area. The travel screen's close button is removed to make sure the player actually does travel somewhere. These triggers are usually placed in elevator shafts at the end of a level. They only have one attribute that indicates whether they should open the ranking screen before the travel screen. The ranking screen will also only be opened if the player actually is in a level. Title triggers show a title to players that enter the area. They have two attributes, being large and text. Large defines whether the title should be a large title with a typing animation or just a small box title. Text is the title that will be shown. It can be a normal string or a translation key. Breaking the order here a bit, title listeners do the same as title triggers and have the same attributes, only that they display the title for every player in the listener's parent room when the flag bound to them is activated. Damage triggers apply damage to entities that enter the area. They have three attributes, damage type, amount, and per tick. Damage type is the type of damage it applies. The amount is also self-explanatory, and per tick makes it so that the entity within the trigger takes damage every tick instead of once upon entering. And that's all conventional triggers done. There is one out Layer, though. Redstone receivers are only technically triggers. They don't perform an action when an entity triggers the area. In fact, they don't use an area at all. Redstone receivers set the flag bounce to them based on if they're powered by redstone or not. They have no attributes. Now onto listeners. Almost all listeners have a delay attribute. It defines how long the listener should wait after the flag bounce to them activates to perform their action. If the flag isn't active anymore once the timer ends, no action will be performed at all. Redstone listeners give off a redstone signal while the flag bound to them is active. The naming can be a bit confusing considering there's also redstone receivers. Just remember that listeners always listen for flag value changes and perform actions accordingly. Redstone listeners have two attributes, max pulse duration and delay. Max pulse duration defines how long the trigger should give off a signal for at most. If the flag is deactivated before the period ends, they stop sooner. Door listeners are used to make doors or generally replace blocks in their area. When a flag bounds to the door listener is active, the door is closed. They have five attributes. Closed block, open block, reset block, delay, and scroll. The closed and open blocks are exactly what they sound like. The door's area gets filled with the closed block when it when a bound flag is active. An important thing to keep in mind though is that only blocks of the opposite type will be replaced. So when a door opens, only closed blocks in the door's area will be replaced with the open blocks, vice versa. The value can be set to any blocks identifier. The reset block is the block that will be used to fill the area when the door resets, and this defaults to the open block. When resetting, only blocks of either the open or closed type will be replaced with the reset block. This attribute also takes any identifier or null to change it back to default to the open block. Scroll indicates whether 
skull should be displayed on the door's area's horizontal faces while the door is closed. Spawner listeners spawn an entity while the flag bound to them is activated, and despawns the entity again when the flag is deactivated. That is, if the entity is still alive at this point. It has three attributes, entity type, delay, and yaw. The entity type is the identifier of the entity that this spawner spawns. It doesn't necessarily have to be an autocraft entity either. Any identity identifier will work. Yaw defines the rotation the spawned entity should have upon spawning. Sound listeners play sound when the flag bound to them changes. By default it only plays when the flag activates though. There are five attributes. Delay, sound, volume, pitch, and play and deactivate. All of these are pretty self-explanatory. Sound is any sound identifier. You can add custom sounds yourself using resource packs. Volume is the volume at which the sound is played. Due to how Minecraft works, the volume is technically kept at 1, or at least won't change audibly doing that. Values higher than 1 make it audible from further away though. Pitch is the pitch at which the sound is played. Its value can be any floating point number between 0 and 2, default or normal pitch being 1. Changing the pitch will also change the sound speed. Play and deactivate indicates whether the sound should be played again when the bound flag is deactivated. Explosion listeners will cause an explosion at their block position when the flag bound to them is activated. It's an autocraft explosion, so it won't break blocks and is a lot more controllable than vanilla ones. They have three attributes, delay, damage, and radius. These are again pretty self-explanatory. Damage is the amount of damage that the explosion does in half hearts, and radius is the radius of the explosion in blocks. Light listeners act similar to light blocks, but only emit light when the flag bound to them is active. They have two attributes, level and delay. Level is just a light level. It can be any intact number between 0 and 15, bounce inclusive. Cyber grind listeners are a bit special. Ah, and first a small disclaimer. There can only be one act of cyber grind at a time. That makes these not very suitable for levels. That being said, when a flag conventionally bound to cyber grind listeners is activated, it starts a cyber grind at the block's position. To allow for more players to join, the cyber grind is announced in chat and afterwards there's a short delay until it actually starts. It has two attributes, wind flag and rounds. Rounds is the amount of rounds the cyber grind will last. Damn, that's crazy. The wind flag is a bit of a unique attribute. It's basically a second flag that can be found to this listener. When the cybergrind is beaten, the flag set here will be activated. Hey, I, I forgot that this silly guy existed. The level unlock listener unlocks one level. When the flag bounces to it, activates, and it has one attribute, and that attribute defines which levels are locked, and that's all there is to it. Now for the final free mapping blocks, I have to explain another small concept. So far, all flags were local to rooms. It's the second type of flags being global flags. Instead of being tied and limited to a room, these flags are stored in the dimension, and instead of a simple boolean value, they hold an integer. A quick disclaimer though, they aren't suitable for levels, since all levels get instantiated in the same dimension. The following mapping blocks use global flags instead of regular ones. The blocks themselves still need to belong to a room though. They all work like their regular counterparts. Global redstone listeners give off a redstone signal, bound global flags values the same as their activation value attribute. Global redstone receivers set the bound global flags value to either their active value or inactive value attributes when it starts to stop being powered by redstone. Global title listeners display a title for all players in the dimension it's in when the global flag bounds to it changes to its activation value attribute. The other attributes work the same as with regular title listener. And that's all of them. That took a while. Anyways, on to some practical examples. Where you build your levels doesn't really matter, since you save them as a structure file in the end anyways. I built all of my levels in uh, the limbo dimension. Because, well, there's a lot of space, no awkward terrain, it's up to you where you build them. Alright, let's start with a simple door. I've already prepared the store frame. The first thing we're gonna do is enter edit mode. So we just do slash edit. There we go. Next, we place our room block. I recommend placing it somewhere you will remember it, so I'm just gonna place mine here. Next, we gotta change the area of the room to encompass like this. There we go. I've already placed these uh, cherry planks as markers for the corners, and I really recommend placing these uh, visual markers because they, they really do help with scripting the levels. And I also recommend using blocks that aren't used in a level, like Whitney Colored Wood, or it's concrete or whatever, something that stands out. So now to change the room's area, we just do edit, area, room, and now we right click both of the corner markers. And there we are. Now to make it a really simple door, we only need the trigger and the door listener. Let's add the flag that will open the door next. Do slash edit, flag, add, and just call it something that makes sense. In this case, I'll pick door. On the top left, you can see that door was added to like the flags thing and it's currently in red to signify that it's off. When it turns on, the text will turn green. Let's next place the door listener. I usually place those close to or around the door frame 
but you can place them wherever you want. Next, we need to uh, change the area of the door listener to encompass like this thing, since, since we want this to be filled. So we do edit area again, and then this time, listener. Now we're just stretching these two corners, and there we go. Now we bind our door flag to the door list. So we do edit flag bind listener door. Doors work in a way that they are closed when the flag is active, and they're open when the flag is not active. What blocks you choose for either state doesn't really matter though. So to make this a little bit simpler still, uh, I will basically swap the two states by setting the close block attribute to air and the open block attribute to Bruce Planks. Now the door basically opens when the flag is activated. The only problem is it will still display a skull as if it were locked. To prevent that, simply set the uh, skull attribute to false. Now we're just going to place the trigger and set its area to something around the door frame. Now we just gotta bind a flag to the trigger as well. So we do edit flag bind trigger door. And now the trigger will activate the door flag when something is inside the trigger, and the door will open when the door flag is active. Now if I move into this trigger. There we go. Simple door. Alright, let's make a simple room that will lock itself and spawn enemies next. I've already placed these two doors, and they will close when the active flag is set to true. They will also display a skull to signify that they are locked due to the enemies. To make the enemies actually spawn, we'll place a new trigger and set its area to somewhere within the room. There. So if a player were to walk through here, like the doors will close and the enemies spawn. I recommend making these uh, triggers multiple blocks wide, because if a player is really fast, they could just pass through thin ones without triggering them. Now we set the trigger's self-reset attribute to false, so if something moves into it, it stays active. For debug purposes, I will now set the room's reset candle down to 1, so I can simply reset the room by moving out of its bounds for one tick. Now just bind the active flag to the trigger and place an enemy trigger. We will also bind the active flag to the enemy trigger, and then we set the enemy trigger's area to encompass the entire room. And finally, we'll place a enemy spawner listener, and we'll also bind the active flag to that. Now if we move into the trigger, enemy will spawn, and both of the doors will close. Now if we kill the enemy, the doors will open again due to the enemy trigger uh, detects that there isn't an enemy anymore and thus sets the active flag to false again. And that is the simplest room setup that you can have. You've probably already noticed kind of an annoying issue with this room. The doors are always open and that is not very cool. So next I'm going to show you something I call a complex door. We add another flag and we'll just call it door 1. Now we'll bind this flag to this door. Now we add another flag called door one trigger and place a trigger that will open the door. Now this trigger won't now this trigger won't have the door itself bound to it, but the door one trigger flag. So now if we move into this, door one trigger gets set to true. We move out again, so it gets set to false. And the door doesn't do anything. Awesome! I'll just quickly change the door's attributes again so it works like the first simple door that we had. Okay, just for demonstration, I'll uh, bind the door one trigger flag to the door. If I move into this trigger, door opens, move out, the door closes. And that's what we want. I'm gonna bind the door one flag to it again. So now it doesn't do anything for now. And this is where things are gonna get complex. So we want the door to open when we approach it, but we also want it to be lockable. So we need to make it so that the door doesn't open while it's locked. So to do that, we use these redstone components. First we place this listener and bind the door one trigger to it. Now if we move into the door one trigger, the redstone there will activate. Now we place the redstone receiver and bind the door one flag to it. So now when we move into the trigger, the door opens. Now we just need to interrupt the redstone if the doors are supposed to be closed. To do that, the simplest way is to use a piston. When the piston is retracted, the block can't get powered, so this won't receive any power either. So if I move into this, the door doesn't open. So now we place a redstone torch behind that and place another redstone listener. This one will have the active flag bound to it. And that's essentially it already. If we approach the door, it opens. And when this is active, it doesn't open anymore. Perfect. Now the only thing that's missing is the lock symbol. To get the lock symbol back, we're going to use the second door, and we'll bind the active flag to it. Then we simply set both the closed and the open block to air, so this door block will basically not do anything. It'll just replace air with air. The thing that it does that is important is display the, the skull. So now if we change the area of the listener to the same as the other doors, and we move into this trigger, 
Let's go with the display, and the door doesn't open anymore. But if I re reset the room, the door opens just fine, no school is displayed. If you want to give the entire thing more immersion, I guess, you can also place a sound listener uh, right at the door, and bind the door one flag to it. Then we simply set the sound attributes to block chest open, and now if we approach the store, it'll open and make a door sound. Very awesome. So this room doesn't have a lot going on in it, and yet we're using a lot of edit mode blocks already, so you can tell that stuff gets cluttered pretty quickly. Now a way to solve that is a bit cursed, and it's something I call cross-room scripting. It basically means that you use multiple rooms at once. The best example of this is Limbo 1. You have got two rooms encompassing the entire level, one of them being something I call a super room, because it's supposed to keep all of the level data, so if, if the blue score was taken, if the red score was taken, and so on, and like do redstone stuff with it, and the other is door control. That takes care of all the doors. If I just look in this direction, you can already see why I say it's cursed. You can only see half of the components, and it, it's it's a mess. It's such a mess. But yeah, at its core, it's relatively simple. The only problem is that it gets complicated pretty quickly. So I'm just going to add a second room, call it door control, add the area of the room. So now the both rooms have the same area. Add the door one and door one trigger flag. And now we reparent the door components to that room. Now all the important door components are in one room and the actual flight logic is in the other. And yeah, that's already the gist of cross-room scripting. Just like the entirety of edit mode, the parts by themselves are simple, but adding them all together and having like a, a ton of them makes things get more complicated as you go on. So for that reason, organizing your stuff and developing your own systems and shit is pretty important. The last thing I want to show are multi-wave rooms. These are kind of complicated because you need to somehow figure out how to like spawn multiple waves. The first instance of those is already in a Prelude 1. I've removed this wall so I can kind of show like what is going on. So when I move into this trigger, wave 1 gets set to true, spawning these three enemies. When wave 1 is true, it will close the doors as long as this piston is extended. And this piston only won't be extended when both wave 1 is true and clear is true. Clear is set to true when there are no enemies left. If clear is true and wave 2 isn't, then wave 2 will be enabled. This back here looks a bit complicated because I, I like my things to be self-resetting, but it's, it's not really necessary since the levels get instantiated anyways. I just kind of like it for debug reasons. Let's just look at it in action. So there we go. Wave 1 activates, the doors close, and when the enemies get killed, Clear turns on, which turns off this torch as well, doing this uh, flip-flop thing, enabling wave 2. And now wave 2 is enabled, but since there are new enemies, clear isn't enabled anymore, and the door piston won't be retracted. So now if I call these as well, the door piston retracts, and the doors open. And there we go. This looks very complicated, and it slightly is. It is slightly. Um, if you actually know what you're doing with redstone, then you can definitely simplify this a lot. This is just like the first circuit I came up with, and kind of just pasted this exact thing everywhere. Yeah, the same exact thing appears at this level three times. When you build a component like this once, you can just copy them and paste them into your levels at any point, which makes working on levels a lot easier. It's kind of like coding. Once you find a solution to a thing once, you can just use it again and again. And there we go. You've made it until the end. You probably skipped around a little bit at least. If you didn't, then holy shit, you just gave me a lot of watch time. I hope this video was of any help to you at all. And I hope that I don't have to make a video as long as this again anytime soon. Because holy shit, it's a lot of work. Anyways, now I can finally take a short break from Autocraft. It'll probably only last like a week or so, but within that week I don't plan on touching Autocraft at all. I will probably still work on other things because I, I can't really... I just... I don't feel well doing nothing, right? Like, I have to always be working on something, and I kind of work on too many things, or want to do too many things to do all of them, so I always have something to work on, even if it's not like a long-term thing or just a side thing or an experiment or something, there's always something I want to do. Anyways, enough yapping, have a nice day.